Well, um, I rather sympathise with Bernadette when she said she felt a bit out of her depth being asked to do that because she's more comfortable with media than she is with uh, analysing deep notions of truth. Um, I'll begin with a very brief anecdote indicating why I'm sympathetic. I spent um, a brief um, week, it was, some years ago, doing work experience uh, with the possibility of joining going to the bar. And I sat in on the trial of News of the World um, for their invasive spying on Max Mosley. Some of you might remember the, the famous Nazi sex orgy and all of that. And I sat there next to the junior council being quite overawed by everything that was going on. But inside, uh, I was kind of putting together three distinct strands in my head that were never quite coming together. There was the media, there was the law, and then there was the truth. The, the moral truth, the spiritual truth, the human truth, whatever you like. And as I sat there thinking, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? Um, I just kept on gravitating my mind that really the set the questions of the, the media and the law, what they ought to do, what they uh, really are about, comes back to what we think the truth is. So with that in mind, and also being only a very lowly theologian on this um, panel of eminent journalists, uh, I thought I would just offer some brief theological reflections which may or may not be of use in our discussions. seems one of the things that we're finding today is that there's a, a fantastic uh, diversity of genre of the kind of reflections that we're hearing. And that surely is part of the challenge of what we're trying to do, is that we're dealing with quite different genres of human discourse. So um, I, um, what I'm about to say is inspired by the lecture given by Dennis Turner, which I'm sure many of you are at, um, in which he discussed the work of a particularly well-known Dominican, Herbert McCabe. Um, and the theme I want to look at, which perhaps sounds a bit grim, but I hope we'll discover that it's not entirely grim, um, is the sin of the world. What Dennis Turner describes McCabe's view of the sin of the world being uh, taken, of course, from the Gospel of John. So we'll begin just by looking at what I thought was really the key, the key point from Turner's lecture. So, the world cannot know itself on its own terms. Its socially organised structure of internally generated misperception is pervasive, universal. Sin cannot truthfully tell its own story. It has no power of its own to know its own truth. The sin of the world is that rather tediously common sinful predicament. The sin that we are all in, rather than the sin that we do, a general condition of sinfulness that in one way or another mediates all our actions, whether personally sinful or innocent. There is a world of sin, for sin has made a universe for itself. And one of the consequences of the world's sinfulness is that the world does not know things, does not see things that are there to be seen. It does not know the truth, its own truth. All the emphases there are original from Turner's lecture. The first thing really I want to point out is the fascinating uh, choice of the word mediates. A general condition of sinfulness that in one way or another mediates all our actions. Um, so on one level, if we were being pessimistic, we might conclude from this that the media can't tell the truth, doesn't tell the truth. And in fact, we really shouldn't expect it to tell the truth because they're so caught up in this global misperception, this cognitive failure, which is sin, um, that they, they, they can't be an organ of truth in their many different ways and guises. They participate as, as most characteristic of that fundamental human activity, which Nicholas was talking about earlier, of representing ourselves to ourselves and to others, which the media is. Um, they just participate in that uh, condition of the world, which is no particular person's fault, which can't, the blame of which can't be laid at anyone's door, but uh, nevertheless renders us and it incapable of telling the truth of this world. A philosopher I'm fond of, Mark Rowland, uh, who is, I believe at this point, and, and it won't surprise you to hear, glossing Nietzsche, uh, is asking what sets human beings apart from non-human animals. And he says, human animals are the animals that believe the stories they tell themselves. 
And as we all know, the relationship between storytelling and truth-telling is fraught. McCabe and Turner uh, are suggesting, not to mention John's Gospel, that we do not tell the truth about ourselves because we just can't. We can't even see it, let alone tell it. But we do still believe the stories we tell ourselves. And this would be one way of looking at what sin is, thinking that we possess command and control the truth about ourselves, our own story. Timothy said earlier that Lance Armstrong was asked why he lied, and he said, because I want to control the narrative. I think um, there are, for those who might be familiar with his work, there are shades of René Girard here. It's not in societies, so we're talking at the collective level now, it's not in society's interest to know the truth about what sustains it or what keeps it going. Because for that truth to be exposed would somehow spell the dissolution of the society. Nicholas boldly identified this, although not quite in a Girardian key, when he pointed out that it's ultimately the threat of violence which sustains a society, even if we're reluctant to admit it. But Girard's point is that the violence which sustains a society functions by exclusion, by the sacrifice of the innocent. And I often think that McCabe's conception of the meaning of Jesus' death has that Girardian quality. Timothy said that the truth we're really interested in is the story, uh, is, is the truth of who we are. That's the story that we want to know, the truth that we want to know. But the death of Jesus shows us the truth of who we are on this Shiradian view, and in so doing, it actually dissolves the stories we tell ourselves. It exposes their falsehood. And this exposure, this confrontation with ourselves, actually is our salvation. So our instinct to know and desire the truth about ourselves is a vital one, but also a crucifying one. It leads us, if we actually follow it, to a confrontation that we don't know or tell the truth. And this is expressed in Christological terms, if you like, by the fact that the one we exclude, the one we sacrifice, that's the one who takes away the sins of the world. Rowan Williams, in his book, Resurrection, he, he describes this extremely beautifully. He says, it is as our victim that the risen one comes to meet us. <coughs> so returning to the media, our stories of ourselves, of which our media are a paradigm case, are perhaps the most dangerous thing about us. They are the means by which we systematically obscure our own truth. They manifest the sin of the world. But having said all of that, which is a fairly um, poor picture of what we do in our media, the presupposition here, of course, is that there is a story that does need to be told, that that storytelling function is really, really crucial and central and, and indispensable. And media, in their better moments, as we heard so eloquently um, from Timothy this morning, do try to get beneath the stories of convenience, the, the self-serving stories, to hear and tell the stories of those who otherwise wouldn't be heard. And they also, and this is a point that uh, was touched on in some of our questions earlier, they also implicitly seek a tale of origins, uh, by which I mean they try to show the non-necessity of the world being as it is. That's one of the things that happens if we tell the story. We start to indicate in some oblique manner that the story could have been told differently. It could have not turned out like this. But there's a poignant futility to this from the Christian point of view. And this is brought out very beautifully by a point that um, Turner brings out um, in relation to the Genesis story. He says the Bible doesn't try to offer strictly speaking, an, absolute, an account of the absolute origin of sin. As any school child, by the way, will be able to tell you, because they will say, oh, where does the serpent come from? If you've ever tried to teach Genesis to children, the story of the fall. Uh, it's a, it's a, a difficult thing to do, because they figure out very quickly they're not being given an explanation for anything. And that's really crucial, and this is why. This is what Turner says. Because the perspective that would be able to give an account of the absolute origin of sin is outside of the story. There is no beginning from the point of view of sin itself. It's simply inaccessible. Anything we have to say about that origin comes from within the story of its having happened. 
It can't gain that vantage point. It seems to me this casts quite helpful light on the narratives generated by our media, of which are, by and large, as we know, stories of suffering and failure and stories of a kind of endless cycle of endemic brokenness. They're told so often with that lingering, and this may, may, may be very, very subtle. I'd be interested to hear if people agree with me about this, but they're told with that lingering sense of uncomprehension, which is often particularly powerful in news media, that faint atmosphere of inexplicability, which can never be wholly suppressed by the journalistic voice, the voice of the BBC presenter who tells every news story as though it was equal and indifferent. The very business-likeness of that voice somehow intensifies the atmosphere of inexplicability. No one inside the story knows why it should be like this. The search for a why in our media always ends plaintively and with failure. And this is surely one of the more beautiful things about our media, because our best journalism is still driven, can still be driven, by a profound indignation that the world should be, in fact, like this. That we have to live in a world like this. And it expresses a sheerly unjustifiable but doggedly held expectation that we shouldn't have to live in such a world, that the stories could be told differently, they could be different stories. This indignation and expectation are, I'm suggesting tentatively, are the clue, really, that the story of sin knows it's originless, knows no total account of itself can be given. The plaintiveness, the uncomprehension, which I certainly feel, um, and when you hear our very best and most brilliant uh, journalists and reportage and so on, it has that same atmosphere, uh, is, is that plaintiveness is the best sign of truth, the best sign that it has bumped up against the apparently arbitrary limits of the sin of the world and finds them to be offensive. One way of approaching uh, or understanding what the media do, one framework for approaching them, is that they tell the story of sin. They try to narrate sin in the sense that they are a means, and in our age, surely the primary means, by which we try to narrate the condition of this world. And this is a necessary endeavour. It's a story that we need to be able to take responsibility for the world as it is. It's the way we find out who we are. Nicholas's words made admirably clear both the ambiguity and the necessity of this enterprise. We do need to have this storytelling at a collective level, not merely at a face-to-face -face level. And it's, a, it's an expression of our distinctively human dignity that we engage that medium where we can encounter in some form the reality of our existence as a society. And this answers to a certain extent, anyway, the part of me, and this perhaps has been touched on as well today, that is continually worried that our um, <coughs> consumption of media is a, a kind of voyeurism. Uh, our media are received, as, as Nicholas said and Timothy, not only as, as information, but also as entertainment, as diversion, which is only natural if we're paradigmatically social. Our primary diversion in life. Our primary absorption is one another. And this surely is one of the most disturbing aspects of the public role of media in our time, that they are essentially consumed, not in every case, but widely. Uh, they are designed and driven for consumption to excite interest, to excite a desire, which is surely to a large degree, um, and I'm ready for disagreement here, Surely, to a large degree, that curiositas, which Augustine identified as the restless questing of a mind for distraction and diversion because it has found no resting place. And this should make us, again, to pick up another theme that's been touched on, justly cautious about the excessive celebration of the universal, universalization of media opportunity, which we call social media. It seems that on one level, at least, social media give people a greater opportunity to speak truth to power, to tell their own stories. But this, we know, is not really quite it, because Twitter and Facebook and so on also give ever greater opportunities for abuse of the truth, 
for a cacophonous proliferation of opinion. And further, although they give us opportunities for more diverse and sustained relationships, there is a danger that it actually destroys real human community because the virtual personality is never the whole person. It's never the, the cross upon, the face, which is the truth of a person. And this is not to deny the essential role that social media have played in uh, what we think of as movements for democracy and freedom, such as the Arab Spring. But the salutary point of McCabe, or rather of John's gospel, is that wider dispersion of the power of narration, of just being able to tell the story in one's own voice, does not somehow eliminate the sin of the world. The wider the conversation can be, we think, the more every human person can have their own media outlet, the freer and happier we will all be. If only all the children in Africa have the internet, suddenly uh, all their problems will go away. <coughs> but we know that ISIS can use social media just as well as the Arab Spring. And the internet amplifies the condition of this world. It doesn't overcome it. Amplifying human voices is not all that's required for truth. Just to close up these thoughts, um, hopefully on a, on a more positive note. The fundamental characteristic of this humanity, as I've been suggesting it here, is that we will necessarily narrate our own condition, the condition of the sin of the world. And this is a right enterprise, but also a doomed one. We are continually trying to come to terms with the way the world is. We're continually searching for origins and endings for that beginning and ending in the light of which all the stories will make sense. And in our age, the media as our shared space is the dominant way in which we conduct that precious enterprise which never quite succeeds, but which nevertheless expresses who we are. So, what is truth-telling then for us as Christians? And how could we possibly uh, bring that to the media. In the Christian vision, the true story of human beings, of every human being and of humanity in general, cannot be possessed by us, but nevertheless it's not wholly outside our telling. It has been given to us, the truth about ourselves, and that gift continuously renews in us the freedom to tell the truth. Even though we're in the midst of this enigma of travail and incomprehension, and we don't see either the beginning or the end, we are given to know the true story, nevertheless. And the true story, as McCabe says, is God's story, God's story of who we are. And that story is told preeminently in the Eucharist. There we tell the story of the one who takes away the sin of the world, and in so doing, restores to us our capacity for truth-telling. There we learn our capacity for falsehood, betrayal, forgetfulness, obfuscation. But we also learn of our inextinguishable potential to be tellers of the truth, to memorialize faithfully that constantly renewed gift of truth, which, as has been said this morning, alone engenders real human community. So searching for a more truthful media can be framed like this. How could it be a more frank telling of the reality of our condition, which knows it is not in possession of the full story, which carefully nourishes those marks of its own incompleteness, of its own limits, its indignation, its uncomprehension, its protest, its unjustifiable expectation of justice, and not pretend to a false command or a false completeness or a false confidence? And how can it express in a mode appropriate to each medium, each form of social representation which is necessary for our common life, how can it express the truth which judges all our stories, which is the truth of God's faithfulness, which in the midst of deception and betrayal and death tells all our stories as stories of resurrection? Thank you. <laughs>